a rag bag of a project, so I thought it might be useful to give you a bit of background as to why we finished up doing this rather odd collection of bits and pieces uh, under the title of Fire and Water. <coughs> For those who are unfortunate miss, uh, not to actually know Assent, there it is. Um, and I just draw attention to two areas within Assent generally. First of all, I'll pull down this way, and the north coast is up that way. Uh, most of the Iron Age remains in Assent can be found around the coast. Most of the Neolithic things can be found in this valley. Uh, and that's sort of significant in trying to sort of understand what's going on in the area. Um, we call the, the central valley, which Egypt has the valley of the kings, we have the valley of the cairns. <laughs> um, we've got about 40 in a Y-shaped valley about uh, 8 miles long. So it's a very, very dense concentration of cairns. 28 of them are definitely chambered cairns. Quite a few others could be chambered cairns, but are just basically too wrecked uh, to be uh, worked out at this particular stage. Uh, and then there are a few that look as if they're curved cairns from a slightly later period. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on these in terms of survey over the years, and back in 2011 we excavated this one on the shores of Loch Borrowan, uh, which is right at the highest sort of point in, within this valley, and a number of people here were helping with that excavation, mainly in torrential rain in the three weeks uh, in August and early September 2011. But it uh, certainly exposed the sort of central area of the cairn, gave us a much clearer idea uh, of how it was constructed and when. So that was, we've, so we've done quite a lot of work on that kind of area. We've also worked in terms of survey uh, on the coastal uh, strip of Assent, where we have this range of Iron Age uh, sites. Uh, the split rock at Clactol, we've got vitrified walling up around it. The great rock at Clactol, which I'll come back to uh, in a moment or two. And then continuing around the coast, a series of dunes and rocks and island dunes uh, and island rocks, call them whatever you like, because there are quite a few of them don't exactly fit into any category. Um, this one is the one we've worked on most, the Clactol. Uh, more of it survives than anywhere else, and it's larger than any of the others. Uh, and some years ago, the Royal Commission was involved in one of the groups doing a survey there, and we nearly lost Eve at that particular point because he got stuck in a hole and had to be dragged out. <laughs> <laughs> um, since then, we've done quite a lot of work, including extensive uh, excavation and consolidation work around the entrance, and that revealed that this particular structure uh, seemed to have fallen down in the last few decades uh, BC. Uh, quite suddenly and dramatically, leaving almost certainly intact uh, Iron Age uh, occupation layers underneath the rubble in the middle. And the other area that we've worked on extensively and found out quite a lot about is actually where historic Aston started, with its concern for the state of uh, Arbrecht Castle, Calder House, and the old Kirk, all at Inch and Lanf. And these were the first project that historic Aston was involved in back in 1997 and onwards, most of that project was completed by 2006 and gave us quite a detailed understanding of the Middle Ages, later Middle Ages, and the early modern period. And more recently, through the Scotland's Rural Past uh, project, we worked on the uh, pre-clearance remains, uh, and that resulted in an excavation at one of Assen's long houses, uh, and surveys of many, many more structures around the area. So those are the things we've been working on from 1997 through until two or three years ago. But it left a few mysteries. What about the Bronze Age? We kept coming across odd bits and pieces. We've got quite a few crannogs in different places. We have got round houses, though very, very few and certainly very few compared with the large numbers that Anna's been discovering further south. Uh, we have a few curved cairns, and we have some burnt mounds. Um, and so that's, but are they Iron Age round houses, or are they Bronze Age round houses? We didn't know. 
Um, so we began to think that a project that did a little bit of investigating into the Bronze Age would be a good idea. We also know very little about the early medieval period. Uh, the fragments of a large uh, cross, which has been dated to the 8th, 9th century, uh, have been discovered at Inch and Amph on the present church site. And in Loch Inver, this slab was found in the river, got a cross in the circle there and a cross there. Uh, and there's this moated site next to the church. Uh, and one possible theory for that for a long time had been that it was simply a homestead moat from the Middle Ages, or alternatively that it was an earlier Christian site associated with the cross. So the fire and water project tried to tie together uh, all of these bits and pieces by investigating a little bit about the Bronze Age and a little bit about the early medieval period. Uh, here's looking down on an area uh, called Stromkrupi, and there is the tent, which was our headquarters when we excavated uh, the burnt mound down there. Now, if you really want a dispiriting uh, excavation, then <laughs> dig a burnt mound. <laughs> um, spend an awful lot of time hacking your way through very, very, very concentrated uh, smash to stone, uh, which is very, very difficult to dig, and you find nothing. For days and days you find nothing. Uh, but eventually we did find things. Uh, here, first of all, is just after the stripping off of the turf. First thing that we came across was this clay layer, which I'll come back to later. Eventually, on about day five, I can't try to remember, Charlotte, can you? Is it day five? One of the days that we I guess. Anyway, eventually coming down on the signs of something that actually looked interesting. And this is what we found in the end. Now, this pit in the centre is uh, over two metres wide, about a metre and a half deep. There's a channel here running in from a, uh, a now more or less dried up burn, which runs just along there. Um, one of the things we were wanting to try and find out from this particular excavation was had this been used uh, for cooking, as one theory has had for a burnt man. Now, being that sort of size, probably originally lined with stone, we reckon that the chances of ever being able to get the water in there up to boiling point are almost nil. Uh, and therefore, the alternative theory of the, uh, some kind of sauna uh, or sweat lodge kind of site uh, came much more uh, to the fore as an explanation for this particular burnt mound. The other interesting thing was that clay layer, which you can see there and there and there, because all the dates below that clay layer came in, in the Middle Bronze Age, exactly as we expected. But 800 AD for all the material on top of it, and it's exactly the same sort of material. It was being used for a similar purpose nearly 2,000 years later. How on earth the people in the early medieval period knew that it was a burnt mound and went back to it to use it for the same purpose, or was it pure coincidence? No idea. Uh, there we are at, at the final stages. Uh, there's the, uh, the, the remains of the lining of the tank. Uh, and they're seen from another angle, here's the channel in. At the same time, we were also engaging uh, as many of uh, the visitors to Athens and the local people in Athens as we possibly could through a variety of different activities, uh, showing them the site, uh, little experiments with uh, heating stones and dropping them into water to see how long it took to get them up to boiling. Cooking fish, which proved to be one of the most uh, successful experiments that we engaged in, and Charlotte was in charge of that. Um, and fish was very nice. Um, and certainly, one of the other factors that was under discussion was if you were going to do something like uh, cook your venison uh, in the Iron Age or the early Middle Ages, why on earth boil it when you can roast it so much more successfully? Um, and we also had activities alongside the excavation which had nothing whatever to do with it in itself, but actually drew in people who might otherwise not have come, but did have some link with prehistory. And here we have music through the ages, 
taking us through from uh, ideas about Neolithic instruments, again in part from uh, what's been going on now in Argyle, uh, but uh, a whole day of activities with different styles of music over long periods of time. It was very successful and certainly drew in people who would never have come just to look at a dig and certainly not to dig a bird <laughs> uh, Our other site was the moated enclosure. Uh, we surveyed this back in 2005 and knew a little bit about its overall shape and size. Historic Scotland were, as usual, with scheduled sites very lean and with only them digging very, very, very little trench. Uh, um, but here we are uh, digging away. Um, this is the outside, the bank, the outer bank was there, a very, very steep drop down into a waterlogged uh, uh, moat. Um, and in this area here, lots and lots of iron, slag, and furnace remains. Here a closer view of the actual ditch. We got quite enthusiastic at this point because if you can see the layers within this, and we thought, oh, we'll get some wonderful dating evidence from the top right the way down to the bottom. And as you look across the outer bank through the ditch, you can see that there's a revetted area for the platform on the interior, and then that's going onto the platform. At the end of that area, this is through that revetment, and then this is a possible post hole, which is from just up there. Um, and here's a drawing that shows the whole uh, of the thing from the post hole on the platform, the revetment, the ditch, the moat, and then the back on the outside. Uh, and that gives you a sort of overview. We were extremely fortunate with the weather on this occasion because this we did in February and we had glorious weather every day. The only problem was that it was, the ground was all frozen every morning when we started. But apart from that, uh, it was an extremely good weather. If you went there at the moment, it is all covered in water. We would certainly not be able to wait for it. Another part of the project was to go back to some of those earlier projects that we'd done and create fire heritage trails. Uh, so, take, so that we were able, we've now got those uh, uh, on the website and you can either download your own copy and go on the trail by yourself or we arrange guided uh, trails at various times of the year. And they take you to different areas. This is one of the, uh, this operates within the Cairns area in the valley in the centre. Uh, a coastal trail at Tapton, which takes you to Brock. Um, that's Ardbeck Castle again, and the trail here at Edgar Calder takes you up to uh, a 1770s farmhouse uh, and outbuildings, and there's also Bronze Age the remains up there. To an area with roundhouses and a pre clearance settlement, and this also is a pre clearance settlement with burnt mounds. Four land mounds very close to each other, very small ones uh, along the valley. Um, and we've also continued the work since the formal ending of the project by continuing hunting for roundhouses and recording those using uh, the system that Anna developed for her work in Westeros and Sky, uh, so that there is ample opportunity for comparisons uh, and as we do more detailed analysis of roundhouses in the northwest generally. Um, this is a kist um, in a suspected Bronze Age uh, cairn, very, very wrecked area, something we found when surveying some years ago on the SRP project uh, and have gone back to and we hope to excavate it there next year. Uh, and we would like to go back to that. Uh, and do some more work there if we can eventually get permission from Historic Scotland to have a rather bigger excavation next time around. But in the meantime, that's going to have to sit on one side because we have just heard last week uh, that we've got the first stage towards funding for a half a million pound project to excavate the whole of the interior of the rock at Castor, to partially excavate the area around on the outside where we suspect there are other uh, structures uh, and to excavate all of the chambers, consolidate the main structure uh, and then go into the process of consolidation and presentation to the public for the future. 